All right, Dan, thank you very much for uh, for joining. The first thing I want to say is we met at Vital Signs. Um, it was a it was a fairy tale story come together. Uh, since I, I told you the story that I took a photo for one of my friends to be, uh, you know, photo did by you. I don't know exactly what you call what you do to photographs. Um, and then we just happened to meet at Vital Signs to bring you here and talk about uh, post-traumatic stress within the EMS, fire, and police community. Uh, and I think that's really cool. You're a firefighter, you're a paramedic, now you're an artist. How did that all come to be? Well, I was always, um, I've been a paramedic firefighter full-time for about uh, God, 15, 16 years now. And um, I kind of started doing the photography probably about six years ago, but I did pictures of my dogs and landscapes, and and I kind of did the picture, did the pictures mostly as a reference, and then digitally painted them. And I did that as a hobby, and it was kind of a, a way for um, just something for me to do outside of work, something that was a little bit different. Uh, I like the photography part because it's technical. I'm a bit of a geek that way, um, but I'm also artistic I think so I like the combination of the of the technical part of the camera and then the artistic part uh, it's all digital mm -hmm. and then I developed uh, some pretty bad mental injuries from my work and uh, through my therapy um, we kind of thought it might be a good idea to combine that hobby I had with my work as a way to kind of purge and process some of the experiences that I've had and, you know, I did the first one, I think, in 2014, um, so almost six years ago now. And, um, you know, when I, when I started doing that, uh, it doesn't seem like it would be very helpful, but it takes about a week to do. But during that time, you know, I'm thinking about that call, I'm processing that call, I'm recreating more so what I felt versus what I see. And it's all very personal to me. I don't, you know, I, I still don't create the artwork for other people. It's all based on my own experiences. And, um, you know, when I'm done, it's like I've, I've trapped this image in, in this one-dimensional picture versus it being this organic monster in my head. Um, you know, when I first did that first picture, I, was, I didn't want to share it with anybody. You know, the first image, uh, it's a paramedic in the back. It's actually two images um, when they're working on this guy and then he dies in the back of the ambulance and the paramedic has his gloved hands on his head. And I'm like, there's no way I'm going to share this with other paramedics. They're going to think, what is this guy doing? You know, you don't, you never put gloved hands on your head. It's disgusting. You know, we don't do that. Um, so I never intended to share them with anybody cause I would, I would assume that I was going to get crucified from, you know, at the time, you know, my 30 friends on Facebook that I all knew personally. Mm -hmm. Um, so I never really, I never shared that one for months and months and months. Um, but it was very helpful for me, uh, to process the emotions that I was having. Um, so I continued to do that and I created some more images and, you know, I decided one day, you know, I'm going to share it just because it, it looks cool. It's kind of cartoony looking. Um, you know, I really haven't seen other things like that. And then I thought, you know, I'll just see what happens. I'll, you know, expecting to get lots of negative feedback uh, from just the people that I knew because I didn't really have a big social media reach. And um, the exact opposite happened when I shared that first picture. Well, and that, that was the thing that mm -hmm. as you're telling this story, did you ever think that you would have exploded the way you did? I mean, just just. You know, there's there's thousands of people that follow you on Facebook alone. There's, you know, there's thousands of people you talk to, you know, a year, I'm sure, at conferences. And just your your imagery in the EMS realm and in, you know, the whole first responder realm in general, it, it's everywhere. No one does not know, oh, yeah. oh this, is, this yeah. is that guy, right? They might not know your name, but they've seen your image. Absolutely. Um, you know, how's that feeling to you? You know, it's uh, it's hard to describe because my my initial fear when I created the artwork was the exact opposite of what happened. Uh, so I had no idea that that would happen. Um, you know, it was great because when I create these images, and even now, 
the images they're personal to me and they're they're based on my own experiences i it's important for me to remain you know authentic uh, i don't think or are people going to like this what are they going to think um because i think if i start doing that if i start creating images for other people those concept images i do a lot of commission work but you know those concept images that i that i call um you know, if I start doing them for other people, I think that's that's where I'm going to start failing as an artist and mm-hmm. I, if I stop being authentic. Uh, but yeah, it was wonderful because then I realized that, you know, I'm not alone in how I feel. Um, you know, I just recently did a, a Christmas image um, and kind of talked about the transition from, you know, going to work and, and experiencing things over the holidays and then having to come home to your own family and kind of that transition from tragedy to happiness. Yeah. And um, that was just based on, you know, on a call that I did and I had to come home and, you know, it was, um, so I created that picture about that. Yeah, and, that's... you know, it's my own emotion, but that, God, I think that's almost up to 2 million views now, that picture in a week and, you know, thousands of comments. And um, the fact that other people have, are experiencing, you know, my peers are experiencing the same things that I am. That's huge for me. Uh, and it makes me feel better that, you know, I'm not alone and, you know, maybe I'm not weird for feeling these, these things. And, uh, you know, it's not as uncommon as I, as I think, in fact, it's very common and normal to, to be having these emotions, which for me is very healing. Yeah. And that's, that's the one thing that, uh, through my own journey, um, that I've kind of, uh, come to realize the same thing is, you know, I, I thought I was the odd man out, you know, I, the things I went through and the things I was dealing with, that was all me. And if I show any, you know, emotion or, you know, let, let on that, you know, that maybe something has gotten to me a little more than, it, you know, than it, I've been letting on, you know, that, uh, yeah, my peers are going to, you know, ostracize me or, you know, I'm going to, I'm not, I'm, you know, uh, I'm not hard enough, not salty enough, mm-hmm. you know, that you know, all the phrases, and uh, I mean, I, that that one hit close to home because I worked this Christmas, and my first call, you know, with with half my breakfast in my mouth was a cardiac arrest. You know, so off you go Christmas morning, and uh, you know, you come home Christmas night, and you know, now you got to check the demons at the door and walk in and yeah. hey, Merry Christmas, everybody. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know it's really weird. That's a weird transition that you know only we would understand to make, yeah. or other emergency workers to make that transition from. And, and one of the yep. things that I wanted to get your perspective on was, you know, you've been in the, you know, the fire medic service for, you said, 15 years. Uh, this is my 13th year. You're, you're I think, five, five or six. Yep. Um, and there's always been this, this, you know, EMS, fire, even police culture of there's no such thing as PTSD. Right. We're going to shut it away. It's anti, you know, emotion, anti this. Why do we keep perpetuating that as as individuals in this industry? Uh, All three industries, because everyone perpetuates the same anti PTSD culture. Yeah. You know, I. Unfortunately, that culture is is still there. Like there are people that that feel that if, you know, if you can't hack it, get out, mm-hmm. you know, if you can't, you know, I've, I know there's, there's people that don't want, you know, weak responders in their service. So if you can't hack it, get out, you know, that's a real thing. So it's like, there's, there's two cultures. There's, um, there's those of us that realize that, that this is killing many, many of us. Um, and it's a mental injury, like a physical injury. Uh, but there's another culture of people that think, look, st- I'm tired of hearing you guys whine about it. You know, just shut up and do your job. And if you don't like it, then then find another job. You know, I hear I hear that a lot. Uh, I get lots of emails every day. And, uh, you know, a lot of people just don't understand what, you know, what the big deal is because they are not affected them, themselves and they do see it as a weakness. So that that is a reality. Uh, and there are people that, that believe that, um, now luckily for us, it's not really socially acceptable to say those things or admit those things, uh, because, uh, you know, the awareness for mental health 
for emergency workers is 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 more prevalent than it than it's ever been, which is great. Um, but yeah, there is unfortunately that that stigma is there, and you know as much as we'd like to say um, see otherwise, there are people that are that that get real time um, problems from that. You know, they're they're told they'll come up and they'll say that you know that call really messed me up and. You know, they'll get demoted or they'll get fired or, there are, you know, there are things that actually uh, actually happen from that. So that stigma and that culture of, you know, the suck it up buttercup is still there, um, unfortunately. And, but and I, I think over time that's going to change. Yeah, as I say, and I know for, mm-hmm. you know, even for me, um, I, had a, I had a really bad call a year ago. And um, – one of those ones that you know it's it's, it's a once in a career type of call and um uh, didn't realize things were going on with me personally and then when i started realizing it i i said hey you know i think i might need some help here and come to find out there was e- even though the people that were uh in charge of the agency i was working for at the time wanted to get me help they had no idea how to do it there was nothing in place to mm-hmm. provide any sort of assistance or help beyond, you know, the usual, uh, you know, the the critical incident debriefing that, you know, is nothing more than uh, dog and pony shows, as far as I'm concerned. But, uh, you know, that was it. Yeah. So it, it literally took six, almost almost seven weeks, for them to find some way of lining it up to uh, to get me some help. Yeah, you know, there's a lot. There's so many different different things for us. You know what's going to work for me isn't going to work for you. It's super gray. Like it's not like a, a physical injury where yeah you broke your leg. This is how we fix it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know you break your mind. You know your solution might be completely different than my solution. So it's a really difficult road to navigate. And you're right. A lot of supervisors or services just don't know what to do. Yeah. You know they, you know you tell them that and they're like holy crap. You right. know they just clam up right. Yeah. And they're really quiet. And that could be perceived as. You know, you guys don't give a crap about us, but the reality is they just don't have anything in, in place. And the truth is there's not a lot of um, – it's getting better, uh, but I think there's a long way long way to go. Um, yeah, definitely. And I think that will happen. You know, I, I travel all around the world and I see what other services are doing. Um, and there's a lot of progress being made, I think. Yeah, and I think you uh, your artwork actually helps a lot too. Uh, I know when I see it, you know, online on Facebook, and um, it's funny. The one uh, he brought home, one of your prints, uh, and gave it to me, and it was literally like, "Yeah, that's that's me in the middle, and I'm being ripped mm-hmm. in pieces. You know, ripped in two. You know? Oh <laughs> yeah, I know, uh, what you mean, I know what you're yeah, talking about. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it was like, yeah, no, that, that that was only somebody who does this for a living could make artwork like that because you yeah, can really understand it. Yeah, and I've heard that a lot. But again, those are the experiences that I've had. Yeah. Right. So I'm not unique in, in how I feel. Um, and the great thing about looking at it on social media is, is you can see all the other comments, like even that picture, uh, which is called torn. If you read all the, and every once in a while, I'll go back to those images and see what new comments have come up. Um, I follow other people, what that image means to them. And that's therapeutic for me to, Mm -hmm. to hear that, that to hear my peers, um, kind of feel the same way that I do, yeah. right? Which is, which is healing. Yeah. And I, I think there shouldn't, I don't think people realize the strength of, of peer support. Um, you know, for me anyways, that's, that's huge. You know, I've, I've gone through my share of, of therapists, of psychologists and, uh, and I'm not discounting that cause I think there's a, there's a definitely a place for that. Um, but you know the power of peer support uh, is is huge. I think that's I think that is for me has been most helpful. Anything yeah. else? No, and, and same here. I mean, he uh, he helped hold me up. I had a couple others that uh, you know they they held me up when I was at my uh, my lowest. So it was it was mm-hmm. more you know your buddies that are in the mud with you that uh, that uh, are going to be there to to get you through it than. And yet, yeah. eventually, when I did started getting professional help, then they gave me the, you know, the professional tools to help work through that. Um, yeah, the, the, um, what I've noticed and what I hope is going to happen, and something that I'm kind of preaching now, just through my, the experiences that I've had traveling, is, 
I think in the future, uh, there's going to be a, a full support system or program, uh, which starts with peer support. And peer support isn't only the, the people you work with. Um, you know, it could be me. It could be you. It could, the Internet is huge. There's our community is is global. Um, but to to develop some type of peer support program, um, being that, you know, there's a peer support member that is facilitated, that has facility training or training on how to recognize, you know, signs of symptoms of mental injury. You know, a person that's on your shift, they're not necessarily a therapist, but they have, you know, a two day workshop or something where, right. you know, have someone on every shift that is trained and recognized that can maybe nip things early. You know, hey, man, I've noticed that, you know, this behavior has changed. You know, is everything OK? Yeah. You know, and then when they say, yeah, everything is fine, go, oh, hey, man, this is what I've noticed. These are the specific things that you have done differently. Eh? I'm just checking in. But even that is huge. So that's one component. Uh, and then another component, which I think should also be included, is CISM. Now, I know there's a lot of, you know, it's a bit polarizing CISM, but I think that is a good program for when shit hits the fan, right? So I think that's a great thing. So, you know, if something does happen, um, then that's a good program or good system to, you know, debrief and kind of handle things as they happen. You know, peer support is good for preventative. Uh, CISM is good for, um, you know, reactionary or, or, you know, responding to specific events, um, you know, the big halo events. And then the third aspect, which I don't think a lot of people are paying too much attention to right now is reintegration. Right. So what happens if you are off work for your three months and then you come back to work and talking about services, I don't know what to do. You know, you come back to work after being off for three months. Um, there needs to be some reintegration programs and training for supervisors and peers to, you know, what are we going to do when this guy comes back to work? You know, how can we help him? And, I, and that part, the research that I'm doing now um, that part can either sewer you or it can put you back to work. Uh, almost more so than the initial trauma that happens. So I think that's a really important thing. So I think services or programs that include all three aspects, um, I hope that's what's going to come down the pipe in the future, and that's what I'm really going to start promoting. Now, now is that uh, specific to Canada? The uh, They give you, what, three months off or some kind well, of... Well, yeah, it depends. It's... it's um, yeah, usually, in my experience, from what I've seen, once you're, um, if you're off work because of your mental injury, it's, there's kind of a three month time window where, you know, you can get therapy and, right. and at that time you get reassessed, you often get reassessed over that time. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's not like, okay, at three months you're going back to work. Um, mm -hmm. you know, during that three months you're getting your therapy, you're getting a treatment. Um, and then, you know, at three months is usually when, you know, you can start getting reintegrated, but that doesn't mean, okay, you're back to work, get on the truck. You know, that that's a pretty harsh, um, you know, getting thrown back to the shark, so to speak. There needs to be some type of reintegration program. And there are programs out there. Um, but I, I don't know many services that are, have all three of those aspects in place. And I think if we can do that, then I think we're going to uh, make a big difference, I think. And one of the big things that, that I have issue with uh, just learning about different systems outside of New York, outside of the country, um, is the U.S. in different parts of the country seems to be very archaic in the way they treat and deal with EMS, structure their EMS, structure their fire services. So I was, I was, as you were discussing that, yeah, I was I'm thinking, like three months, three months. That would have been great for you. I, I had to go back. back in the, I had back to go in back work. in service at five in the morning after that crash. Right. And, <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it, it didn't help him any. You know, and and I'll be the first to admit oh. he's heard it. You know, a hundred times. I, you know, this is the first time I'm I'm you know saying it publicly. I totally up until your accident was one of those salty creatures. Like, hey, it doesn't bother me. Why is it bothering you? Kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And it took his accident and the way I saw him fall for me to be like, step back. Whoa, this isn't about me. This is about him. And I love how you put it. 
you know, you you don't just break your, you know, you don't break your head or you don't break um, your your leg, but you break your mind. And I thought that was a really interesting thing that you said yeah. because it turns it into a different way of thinking about uh, about the injury and about uh, the mentality of someone in that place. And, you know, seeing you and, and listening to your story uh, at Vital Signs about the little girl and the teddy bear, I thought was extremely eye-opening. And seeing that picture and hearing your story was was great for me personally, not so much because I could relate, <clears throat> but it showed me a different side that I could relate to Gerard's situation that we dealt with a year ago and that he still deals with. And, and I'm that peer or I'm one of those peers that sits there and go, hey, um, you're smoking a little bit more than you were a week ago <laughs> or, hey, your temper's a little bit shorter yeah. than it was a week ago what's going on yeah. um and i think now there needs to be more of that like you said there there needs to be that peer support um you know we him and i haven't been out of medic school for very long you know this is him and i went to the same medic class um we graduated in in oh what 17. 2017 yeah. and we just lost one of Our uh, classmates. the people that one of the one of the females that graduated with us just took her own life a month two ago. Mo- yeah, yeah, about a month, two two months ago. Um, yeah. you know, and well, she we, was the shining star of the class. And she was the shining yeah. star of the class. Yeah. You know, all and and you know, this was a girl that you know beat cancer twice. You know, had a horrific accident during medic school. Finished that, medic school with one arm, literally. Yeah. <laughs> Learn to do IVs with one arm because she couldn't use the other because it was surgically held up, you know, held together with steel. Um, and nobody saw the writing on the wall. No one sat there and was like, oh, hey, what's going on? You're acting differently. You know, the whole preventable aspect of it. And not that, you know, we want to piss in the Cheerios of the people that didn't help her, but it's another example of how many people succumb to this and do commit suicide. And um, as I said to you in Vital Signs, I now take um, PTSD into the classroom as an educator for EMS with new EMT students and trying to teach them, hey, this is everything you need for medical. This is how to split a leg. This is how to put a tourniquet on this is how to do whatever but then you're going to get that call and this is how you might have to deal with something you know and trying to open up their eyes without scaring them off that you might see some stuff you might wake up at four o'clock in the morning and go to a horrific accident and you might have to figure out something to do like art or you know relying on your peers or whatever you do um so I, I think that's a it's an interesting theory, and I wish we had a three month off period. Yeah, you know to, that's that's that would be amazing for a lot of providers. I haven't had a vacation of more than two days in a row in five years. Yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's it's so sad, you know, yeah. and and I look at all the all the things uh, that Australia is doing with their EMS, how they structure yeah. it, how they are building up their paramedics to be you know, these high class, uh, providers. And we're like, meh, you know, here's, here's nine months certificate. Cool. Whatever. Go be, go be a paramedic, yeah. mm-hmm. you know? Um, and, and I feel bad, you know, I feel bad for the industry here, you know, so we could learn a lot from, from, you know, Canada, your yeah, agency and, and the surrounding, you know, countries. Um, yeah. One of the, uh, I'm sorry to cut you off. One of the things that I wanted to bring up was just a couple statistics that I did find uh, as recent as 2017, um, talking specifically about depression, anxiety, stress, and, and suicide. Um, seven to eight percent of the American population uh, has experienced PTSD at some point in their lives. The researchers then went out and surveyed about 35,000 uh, first responders. And 6% of the 35,000 said, hey, we've, we've dealt with mild to severe depression, anxiety, or stressful situations. 
But then 30% of those paramedics say they have developed some form of PTSD. 30% of 35,000 is a significant number, you know? And that's a small sampling. You yeah. know, that that's maybe four counties in New York. Yeah. You mm-hmm. know, let alone the entire United States and around the world. You know? Um, and as you said, you know, they're they're not getting promotions. They're not getting um, you know, they're feeling different about going to work. You know, uh, many of these responders said, you know, their supervisors would treat them differently. Yeah. Their coworkers would say, hey, you're a weakling, go away, you know. And and like you said, uh, a chunk, 35 percent said they weren't going to be promoted to a supervisor or a administrative position yeah. solely based on it. And that's that's not only unfair, but it's it's taking the industry in the wrong direction. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's um, you know, mental injury. I try to equate with physical injury. So you wouldn't, you know, why would you not promote someone because they broke their leg, right? It's it's right. like, and, and how long does it take to to recover from a broken leg? You know, you bust your femur. That's what at least six to eight weeks, and then plus physio. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you're going to be out for a long time. Um, but no one's going to think, oh, you can't be a good firefighter because you broke your leg, right? Or uh, you know. It's, get the time off work, get fixed, come back to work. All right. And I, I think that that's going to, I hope that's going to come eventually because it's not a death sentence. You know, if you develop these mental injuries, it's not a death sentence. You just get it fixed, go back to work. Um, there is, there is therapies you can get. There is a therapies that work. Um, and you just get better and then go back to work. Uh, but recognizing the signs, I think that's great that you do that at, at school. Um, it's like, hey, this is going to happen, but you know, it's no biggie. You know, these are the signs. If we can start recognizing these signs and then catch it early, yeah. um, you know, start doing things early before it gets too big. And if for some, you know, if you do feel normal and then it's that one call that really kind of messes you up, um, then there should be a program in place to to navigate that. Um, you know, I don't understand the. <clears throat> You know the the services that are you know go to work get back to work you know your shoot time's too low you know drop the patient off get another another service another call going um, <clears throat> you know if you can't hack it there's the door we got a lineup of other guys coming in and that's you know it's cost around here right I know it's yeah. I know it's very common but it's costing those services a lot of money mm-hmm. right if if you can take care of the mental health of your of your emergency workers. Then, you know, staff retention is going to be higher. Productivity is going to be higher. You know, the money you're going to spend on training is going to be less. Um, and it doesn't take much. You know, it doesn't take much to have a sense of, yeah, you know, they're looking after my mental well-being. It doesn't take, uh, you know, something as simple as, you know, even tracking tracking halo calls. So high QD, low, low occurrence calls, right? So, you know, somebody... And a lot of departments do this, and it's a really simple program to implement. Um, you know, people are tracking. Um, like, let's say if you go out on a call and and you know you do the pediatric cardiac arrest or a pediatric traumatic code, you know, twice in a month, that should be flagged. Mm-hmm. You know, and then someone from the peer support team could be, hey man, you know, we noticed in the last month that you've gone to two, you know, pediatric suicides. Mm-hmm. You know, how are you holding up? You know, something that simple. Right, even if you know, it's a more you know, proactive it, approach. It's right. a proactive approach, yeah. right? And it's just and you could even say, No, man, I'm I'm cool, I'm good. But the thought that, hey, these guys are looking after me and they notice yeah. that they're tracking that, uh, yeah. you know, that simple thing as that could could make a world of a difference for somebody. Right. And that's easy, that's an easy thing to implement. Um, it, it does it does say a lot for administrators that or even just, you know, supervisors, whoever at, at your agency or, or whatever department, fire, police, EMS, doesn't matter, who comes up to you and shows interest in your well-being. Mm-hmm. That, that is the easiest way to boost morale and boost, you know, the, the feelings of, your, uh, of the peers and yeah. the providers in that agency. Just to know that we're not a number and yeah. that you actually care. By walking up and exactly, hey, 
you know what, Turk, I saw that you did a couple bad calls. How you do? You know? Mm-hmm. That that would that I'd be like, I'm doing okay. And then yeah, I'd right, walk like, away huge. and be like, hey, yeah. they care. Yeah. That's cool. And- and I don't want to, I know I don't want to crap on services because there's a lot of services that really do take care of their of their workers and genuinely care about them. Uh, but like we talked about earlier, um, they just don't know what to do. Like they don't. This is something new. They don't. There's no programs in place. There's no. Well, there's some, but they really don't. It's new. They're navigating new waters. They don't really know what to do. Uh, and there's not a ton of resources out there. Um, for them to utilize, right? And I think that's that's going to change. I hope over time. Yeah, and then with that, the stigma will change. Yeah, and even the research to, to pull from. Uh, you know, one of our coworkers, he uh, he he's an instructor. He uh, teaches a CME course, and uh, he was talking about PTSD. And he's like, "Well, I want to go look up some research on this." There was no research data. He said he had to go all the way to World War One and look up shell, you know, stuff on shell shock. And then it became, you know, combat fatigue in World mm-hmm. War Two, you know, and then it, it, it progressed from there. And but to actually have a modern, you know, scientific research example to pull from, he said, "There's none. There's there, yeah, a little drop here and there, and that's it." Yeah, I, I try. I I do a lot of research, you know, when I talk at conferences. I always want to have um, current data in the locations that I'm speaking at. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, when I travel through the States, it's not as, you know, there are pockets of, of surveys being done, but there's really no national, uh, survey. You know, if you search for, you know, PTSD statistics in Australia, man, you'll get a zillion oh, yeah. hits and a zillion different, uh, lots of data cause they're tracking it. Cause they recognize the, the financial cost, um, that it has, um, for mental health and, you know, mental trauma and, and therapy and lost work and sick time it's it's it costs a lot of money uh so it makes sense to track it and try to mitigate it and and lower those those effects um and you know for the people that that are you know this is too much attention or yeah ptsd doesn't exist or you know suck it up buttercup then yeah those statistics come in handy yeah. you know for you know for us in canada it's we're four times more likely to be diagnosed with a mental disorder being a first responder uh, so that's huge, right? And you know the the suicide rates, um, or emergency workers that contemplate or think about suicide compared to the general public, you know those are real. That's real data. That's real statistical data. And the bottom line is it's killing us, mm-hmm. right? If you know in the fire service, um, and I bring this up in my talk, we you know if there's a line of duty death in the fire service, we listen to the tapes. We listen. Uh, you know the procedure what what happened what could we do differently um, you know we'll develop policies and procedures to prevent that from happening again yet when you hear about a you know a firefighter or a paramedic or a police officer that takes their life uh, it just seems to be you know thoughts and prayers yeah, and of course I understand yeah. that it's not as black and white um, to figure out what what was wrong but I think it's really and when you look at the data of, of how many you know, more emergency workers die from taking their life than they do line of duty death. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I'm surprised that not more is being done where, hey, this person took their life, they completed suicide. Um, is there a way that we can kind of look into, like, let's look into the calls that they've done in the past year? Or, you know, well, maybe let's let's talk to them, let's find out what happened. Right. Uh, you know, was it related to their job or maybe that other stuff going on? Uh, but I'm surprised that not more work is being done to try to prevent the next one from happening because it happens so often, more than people realize, I think. I've, I've been in EMS for five years, and I've, uh, I've known three mm-hmm. uh, taking their own life in five years. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. They might, like it, and that's, you know, it's killing people, right? So if people ask, you know, why is this such a big deal? It's like, well, hey, would you ask that same question if, you know, somebody you know, died from line of duty death. And I consider these all line of duty deaths. Um, yeah. And I think it, that's, that's a, a, a very smart way of looking at it. You know, even if it doesn't, you know, e- even if it doesn't happen, Oh, we're fighting a fire and the, uh, you know, the firemen up, oh, they have a heart attack. They pass away up oh, line of duty death. 
Okay, but well, the root cause is it, the, work. the root cause is still the same. Oh. Mm-hmm. You know, stress oh. within the job, and I think, I personally, like I said, as an educator, there is a blatant ignorance and lack of caring about teaching any of this, and you know, in the last it's class, not a part of the curriculum, right? Yeah. This this last class that I was teaching was the first time that I introduced this concept, an eye-opening concept. And, you know, I said to, I said to the whole class, I said, guys, I'm going to talk about something super serious and some of you might not like it. And if it's okay to have to leave the class, I'm not going to, I'm not going to kill you if you leave the class. Nobody left. Two people were in tears by the end of the story, but they, you know, multiple of them came up and was like, hey, thank you for at least telling us the truth. You know, people mm-hmm. want the truth. And, yeah. you know, if if I'm looking to get into this profession or if I'm looking to just grow in this profession, I think the profession should grow around me as well. You know, not yeah. just me striving to grow, you know, uh, as, a, as an individual, but, you know, the the... EMS as a whole, fire as a whole. I mean, fire and police have grown leaps and bounds over EMS, you know, well, since the, the 70s. The nationalized unions and, have something to do with that. And that's, you yeah. know, that's not here nor there. But yeah. um, it, it's just, it's baffling to me how we're just like, oh, yeah, bad stuff happens, but let's sweep it under the rug. Yeah. You know, we're, we're really good at that in certain aspects of, of you know, the first responder group. Mm-hmm. Um, have you heard, uh, I'm sure you have because they've, I've seen them share a bunch of your stuff. So I'm sure you've seen them out on Facebook, but have you heard of the code green campaign? Oh yeah. Yep. So what, what are your thoughts on the code green campaign? Because I know they, they do a lot of raising of awareness. Um, but not so much in the treatment aspect as, as I understand it. Yeah, they're, uh, you know, I think they're a really good resource. You know, I often will, will go to their page um, and look at their their resources available. So I often, like we get lots of emails, um, you know, and if somebody says, you know, I really don't know what to do, I'm struggling, uh, and I find out where they're from, uh, and I'll go to the Co Green campaign and look at their resource page uh, for maybe something in the state that they're in, for any resources available to them, and reference them there um yeah no i'm a big supporter of the cold green campaign i really uh, i think what they do is uh um and i don't i don't think they really claim to be um to offer therapy right i think there they are don't, they don't they, right? they are strict like their their front page is we we raise awareness to what it is and we can aid in getting yeah. you treatment but we don't provide it um, yeah and i I think that's smart. I think there's the the people that I think you got to be really careful about offering aid because if and you know, unless you're trained to to do that or have some type of facility training, unless you're a therapist, um, you know, listening is huge. Like I, people ask me what can I do, um, and I tell them, look, it's really easy. You don't have to be a therapist. You don't have to be even a facilitator training. You know, people that are in that are in the crap that you know are feeling bad. Um, it's quite simple. They want to feel supported. They want to feel validated and they want to feel understood. It comes down to those three things, right? And so as a peer, you can offer those three things, right? You don't tell them, you don't want to solve the problem. You don't want to, okay, well, you should try these therapies. It's like, no, man, hey, I want to make you feel like you're understood. I want you to feel like you're validated and how you're feeling. And I want you to know that I understand what you're going through. That's huge. And we can all do that as peers. Um, but you know, with severe mental trauma, uh, there's other things that have to be done Mm -hmm. potentially. Like there needs to be, you know, cognitive therapy or, um, you know, I know there's a lot of, uh, a lot of alternative therapies coming out there, which are, are helping, but I think that's, that's a good start. So I think, you know, getting back to the code green, I think that's what they offer. You know, they offer validation, support and understanding, which is, which is a big deal. Mm -hmm. I know for me, I did the, um, um, I've been doing the EMDR, so yeah. I guess it's a, it's fairly new, I guess, but uh, it it definitely helped re 
rewire the parts of my brain that weren't uh, that weren't acting right. So, yeah, yeah, and that you know that may not work for everybody. Yeah. And you know, one thing I have, one thing I do have a problem with are, you know, people that crap on other people's therapies or other. You know, yeah. this is my program. You know, other programs, and and you know, unfortunately, there's that kind of mentality when it comes to CISM and peer support. That you know, peer support people say like, yeah, CISM is garbage, and CISM people say, you know, peer support is garbage. But in my experience, they're two different things. It's like apples and oranges, and they're both. There's a root. There's a place for both of them. Um, but you know, that's like saying when you go to Starbucks, you should only have black coffee. If you if you want a mocha, you're an idiot, right? Like, well, no, it's be, I like mochas. I if you like black coffees, drink black coffees. If you like mochas, drink mochas, right? right. It's whatever works for you. Um, you know, equine therapy is huge. You know, a lot of that helps a lot of people. Me personally, I don't like horses. Like they're, they freak me out. They're too big and they scare me. Uh, so that's not going to be an option for me, but for lots of other people that helps, like it helps people. Uh, but I'm not going to say equine therapy is garbage because I know it's not, you know? Yeah. So I think, uh, uh, I really don't want to um, talk badly about other therapies because you never know what's going to help for somebody. And it is so different. And as long as the person that's giving that therapy is, is trained in some way to, to do it. Um, and EMDR is a good example of that. Right. So, um, yeah. So, so with this, uh, with this winding down, I, I have one, one question that I want to ask, um, just as on EMS in general, is there is there something not specifically you know PTSD related or, or mental health uh, related just EMS in general um, as a provider to another set of providers is there something that you see uh, in the world spectrum of EMS traveling around talking to different agencies that stands out to you as like this is the next great thing that should be coming down the pike that someone somewhere is doing uh you know i always when i travel i i try to speak well i always speak with you know the pointy end of the spear so i talk to firefighters i talk to other paramedics that are on the street and i always ask them you know what's it like to work here what kind of protocols do you have um would you guys have for mental health resources uh, you know, something happens. So I always want to get a feeling of that. And then I'm usually invited to, uh, you know, the managers or the CEOs of the companies usually invite me and I ask them the same thing. And then occasionally the unions will, will want to interview me or, or talk to me. Um, so I, I'm fortunate that I get to, to hear a lot of, of that when I travel. Uh, sometimes there's lots of resources available. Sometimes there's nothing. When I ask those questions, it's like deer in a head, like, like, uh, what do you mean mental health resources? Uh, and other times there's lots. And I, I speak with, you know, the psycholo the psychology team or the mental health support team for, for really big services. Um, but the one thing I think, and I always try to do that when I travel, I try to say, okay, what is the next best thing? What's the biggest thing? But the one thing that surprises me the most, uh, you know, Speaking to paramedics in Guatemala, Guatemala and Australia and Finland, you know, all across the states in Canada um, and in Europe, we're all the same. That's the one thing that surprises me the most is the paramedic here mentality wise uh, is the same as a paramedic in Guatemala or in Finland. You know, we have the same. It's the same types of personality. Uh, and the big thing about that is that. You know, we are a giant, you know, the fire department is the brotherhood of the fire department. That's something that's been established for 200 years. I can go in any fire department in the world and say I'm a firefighter and they'll take me in and cook me breakfast. Like that happens. Um, but EMS, we don't realize it, but it's the same. Uh, we just don't, we haven't had as much time to develop that brotherhood and sisterhood. Um, and I'm fortunate because I can see that because I travel so much that we are so similar uh, you know, I've walked into, I think it was in England, in, in London. Uh, I walked in, a, it's beginning of a shift trade, and they're doing their, or shift change, and the new crew came on, and they're having their morning meeting, and they're talking about shoot times, they're talking about paperwork, uh, they're talking about clean, like, I'm like, this could be my morning meeting, right? It's, we talked about the exact same things. Then when I talk to them, um, you know, the connection I have with, 
with my brothers and sisters is uh, it's not something that really surprised me um, is that we are so so similar and each service has their own their own thing that um, that makes them unique you know in Finland they only transport 40% of the people that call them mm-hmm. um, they can say hey I, you don't take a taxi right and I <sighs> joked about it. They, they said, uh, I wish they will send them a taxi. I'm like, yeah, we joke about being taxi drivers. I'm like, yeah, we actually do send them a taxi. I'm like, that's fantastic. That's yeah. great. Um, and, and that's, and that was one of the big things when I went to vital signs a couple years ago, they had, uh, one of the big, like five doctors that runs EMS in Australia and a, as like their special guest and people could, you know, ask them all sorts of questions. And they were like, yeah, we transport to urgent cares. We leave people on the scene with a script we tell them, you know, up oh, pound sand because you don't need us. Take a taxi. We we go to private hospitals. We go to you know uh, the the public hospitals. Mm. I'm like, I want all those options. <laughs> I was gonna say I'm, I'm ready to go learn how to speak Finn. <laughs> you know, yeah, oh, it's, Finland's great. It's a yeah. it's amazing country there. It's uh, um, yeah, I really enjoyed my time there. Uh, or places like in England, they'll have. You know, they'll have, and they do it in Australia as well, they'll have paramedics, uh, you know, answering 911. So they'll be part of that initial call mm-hmm. and they'll determine whether or not an ambulance should be sent or not. Wow. Right. So that's, you know, for us here in, well, not, it's different all through, through Canada, but where I am, um, you know, we transport everybody and, you know, we never have enough ambulances on the road. We, you know, the wait times in the hospitals are, you know, really, really long. It's a big problem for us because we transport everybody. Yep. Um, because we're scared to, I'm personally, I'm scared to cancel somebody. Uh, and if I do, I make sure all my T's are dotted and my I's are crossed and everything is done properly. And I said that backwards on purpose. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, the biggest thing for, you know, what's the next thing that's up and coming as I hope is more of a standardized and, uh, systematic procedure or policies or, or things for mental health support where it's, you know, preventative, um, acute care, mental health support, and then reintegration. Uh, and I think all three need to be in place to, to be effective. Um, and yeah, just, and to simplify the, you know, what's needed and how to support is give validation, um, understand and, and support your coworker, uh, you know, be compassionate. Um, and that's getting better. You know, that's definitely coming down. I think, you know, we're, this is, this is the start of a whole process and procedures that I think are going to come down. I see it in other parts of the world that are happening where, you know, even 10 years down the road, we're going to think that this is a weird podcast we're having that we're even talking about negative stigma when it comes to mm-hmm. mental health. Cause we wouldn't say that now it's like, yeah, you, you know, you break your arm, right? You shouldn't be a paramedic cause you broke your arm. Well, that makes no sense. Yep. Right, no, I, I love that analogy. Yeah. Like that's, if anything, anyone that watches this takes anything away from it, that should be the argument from here on in. You know, you, you sent, we call it simple answers for a reason. That's the most simple answer you could hear of. It really is. You know, mm-hmm. and, and I love that you said that. So Gerard, was there anything that you wanted to ask Dan? Well, I just, I, I just wanted to, to thank you. him for, uh, for what he does is going out there and, and, I know it takes it takes a lot of guts to put yourself out there, like you said, you know, especially that first time. Um, for me, you know, I put myself out there at his class, and I tell my story uh, to the students every uh, semester now. And it that first time, it was uh, it was taking a leap off of, uh, you know, I'm doing a podcast. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> my wife just came home. She's downstairs. Yeah, no, it was a, it was a it was a leap. Uh, that you know didn't know how it was going to work out so i understand and i I thank you for doing it and thank you for doing the uh doing your artwork it uh, it actually does help yeah thanks guys and it's uh yeah sometimes it's not easy but i think the more of us that uh that speak up it then just normalizes it i think that's the whole thing is just to normalize them the mental trauma and equalize it to to physical trauma and then i think things will start getting better once we have that mindset Absolutely. absolutely so dan uh thank you Tell everybody, I just popped up your website on the uh, on the screen, but uh, tell everybody what's what's coming down the road in in your art, where they can find it, what's you know, where they can follow you, all that good jibber jabber stuff. 
Yeah, so I have, uh, I always usually share my artwork first on my social media pages. Um, you know, Dan Sun, if you just search Dan Sun on Facebook or even Google it, I'll pop up everywhere. Uh, that's where you'll see my images first. Um, uh, I have a couple, I just published my third art book. And the art books, I have the images and I also have the narrative and some of the comments from the people that uh, uh, that have seen that image in, in my book. Uh, and I use that money from that book for a scholarship fund for for events that um, that we put on every every year every couple of years uh, but yeah to find me dance on photos.com I also have dance on gallery.com is another website that's more geared toward um, uh, purchasing my artwork but um, yeah that's how you can find me just google me or dance on and go to my websites and uh, I, thanks for having me on your show you guys I, su- I appreciate your support thank you no, thank you so very much like I said you it Seeing you and hearing your story, you know, changed just my outlook within the last year along with his story. Um, And I think if you continue to do it, you will change the, you know, the hearts and minds of a lot of, you know, stale, crusty, salty people in EMS. You know, like I was. I was jaded. I was the guy that said, hey, you know, there's the door. I'm fine. Why aren't you fine? And uh, if you could change that in me. You know, you could change it in anything. So I appreciate your time. Thank you very much for joining us and uh, can keep up the good work. Great. Thanks, guys. Oh,